This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. It's my uh, great pleasure to have been given uh, the opportunity to uh, introduce Nicole Avina, who lists herself as uh, the Rockefeller University and Princeton University, but as of today, she is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Florida Gainesville. Um, and she will talk about animal models of uh, addiction obesity. Nicole? Okay, thank you, Mary, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy and excited to be here to speak with you all today and uh, to hear about all the interesting research that's going on in a field that's near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure it's near and dear to yours, too, because that's why we're all here. Um, I am uh, going to talk about work that I've been doing over the past couple of years, which has been uh, work that I did as a postdoc and a graduate student, um, as a student working with Bart Hobel at Princeton University, and also at Rockefeller University working with Sarah Leibowitz. So the title of my talk is Sugar Addiction in Rats, Proof of Concept. So I'd like to start off by just, again, revisiting the problem. So the problem that we're all here to learn about is why many people are overweight. So we know that foods that are rich in fats and sugars also happen to often be rich in calories, and they also happen to taste very good. So this is one of the reasons why people tend to overindulge. We also know that food is now ubiquitous. Humans weren't designed in a situation where food was always ubiquitous. Our ancestors evolved in situations where food was scarce, and we often had to forage for our food and then binge on it and consume as much as possible when it was available. That normally that's not the case these days. Food tends to be ubiquitous and it's usually freely available to people in the developed nations. Also, food has become very much a part of our social lives and so you will not often get together with your friends if it isn't about having a meal or drinks or some other sort of calorie driven event. We tend to conglomerate with each other in the presence of food and it tends to be something that we do as part of interacting with others in our environment. The other thing is that people don't necessarily always eat when they're hungry. It's often the case that people sometimes eat when they're bored or when they're stressed or when their boyfriend breaks up with them or there's other reasons why people eat, not necessarily only to sustain energy. So the idea has arisen that perhaps some of the obesity epidemic or some of the reason why people overeat could be a result of food addiction. And so the idea would be that maybe some people are eating sugars and fats in many of the ways that people would uh, be over consuming drugs of abuse and that would result in perhaps an addiction. And you're gonna notice that I liberally use quotations and I will use air quotes liberally and then I'll get to this in a minute. We have to be very careful about the terms that we're using and quantify them uh, appropriately and, and I'll, I'll try to speak to that in a few minutes. This food addiction perhaps could result in some sort of out of control eating that might result in an increase in body weight and perhaps even obesity in some individuals. In order to test the idea of food addiction, we had to quantify what we first meant by the term addiction. And so in order to do this, we've um, used the DSM and we've also used some criteria that have been laid forth by drug abuse researchers that have been established, particularly in the field of animal research, to identify a substance as being uh, something that an animal would become dependent upon. And so um, I am showing here a, a classic uh, diagram from George Kube's uh, work where he indicates uh, the cycle of addiction as being something that's associated with binging, which is then followed by a withdrawal or a negative affect when the substance of abuse is no longer available. And that's followed by a preoccupation or an anticipation for that particular substance, which then leads to binging again. And you can see how this spiral goes on and on and would perpetuate itself. So in addition to these three diagnostic criteria, the binging, withdrawal, and craving, or the anticipation, I'm also going to talk today about something called cross-sensitization. And this is a phenomenon in which if 
someone is dependent on one particular substance, they could be dependent on another substance of a similar class. Um, so for instance, you may have heard of uh, substances of abuse being gateways to other substances. So for instance, there's speculation that if you become um, you know, dependent on uh, nicotine, it might make you more likely to then consume alcohol. And so the idea there would be that there is a cross sensitization among these two um, drugs of abuse and that if you're sensitized to one, you could have a cross sensitization to another and be more readily to consume it. So I'm going to focus on these three and also um, cross sensitization. So I want to first go back to um, where this all emerges and so much of this these effects that we're talking about happen in our brains. And so here's a diagram of the human brain. Um, and when we talk about drugs of abuse, we talk about how they have these reinforcing effects. And these systems that are reinforcing for drugs of abuse, namely the mesolimbic dopamine system, which is outlined here um, by the black line, these systems actually evolve to reinforce natural behaviors. And so we were born and we've evolved to have this brain system to make us want to do things that are pleasurable and good so that they will re be able to perpetuate our species. So for instance, it's not done by accident that sex is reinforcing. We need sex to be reinforcing in order to make more people and to perpetuate the human race. Same with feeding. We need to eat in order to live. And so feeding, therefore, is uh, a reinforced behavior. So these naturally occurring uh, behaviors and these natural behaviors work on this naturally occurring reward system in the brain. The problem that arises, and particularly this is the case with drugs of abuse, is that there can be substances that will usurp or hijack this brain system. And so then we're not talking about an endogenous reinforcement. We're talking about something that's a synthetic reinforcer that's taking over this system and hijacking it and really doing sort of an ultra reward upon this system. So clearly, the point here is that this system is in place in our brains for addiction to happen. And in the case that we're talking about here with food addiction, it's the system exists for us to perhaps have a food addiction. I'd like to compare and contrast some of uh, the differences in terms of the brain chemistry that we've uh, been assessing in terms of drugs and foods. So I'm going to focus on three neurotransmitters today when I talk. Now, by no means are these the only three neurotransmitters that we should be focusing on. These are just the three that I happen to study. But by no means uh, should they be considered an exclusive list. So the first one is dopamine. And so it's well known that in, dopamine will increase in response to the administration of a drug of abuse. Every time a drug of abuse is administered, it releases dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which is part of that reward system of the brain that I just showed you about. Now, dopamine will also re be released in response to food. However, this is something that is usually associated more with the novelty of the food. So when you taste a food for the first time and it's new, it releases dopamine. But with repeated access to the same food, the dopamine release tends to attenuate and no longer uh, is increased in response to that particular food. The second neurotransmitter I want to talk about is something called acetylcholine. This is a, a, a neurotransmitter that is um, found in the nucleus accumbens, among other areas of the brain. And in the case of drugs of abuse, we find that acetylcholine is increased during withdrawal from drugs of abuse. So when acetylcholine is elevated, it's usually associated with a negative state where the animal or the person perhaps is not feeling so well and they're in a withdrawal state. In terms of food, acetylcholine is normally thought of as being associated with satiety. And we've shown um, in some of our papers and others have shown that acetylcholine increases during a meal. So while acetylcholine is associated with aversion in the case of drugs, it seems to be associated with satiety in the case of food. In terms of the opioids, if you give an opiate antagonist to someone who's addicted to opiates, it will produce withdrawal signs. Um, and these signs in the case of opiates can uh, be diverse, including uh, shakes and tremors and some other physiological sa uh, signs. Now, in terms of food, if you give an opiate antagonist to um, someone who's consuming food and is not in a, dependent on opiates by any means, the antagonist isn't going to do much. It's not going to precipitate withdrawal unless their opioid system has been primed to be uh, put in a state of withdrawal. That being said, just the sort of background on uh, these different neurotransmitters I'm going to talk about, this led to the development of having an animal model of sugar binging. So we had to start somewhere. We decided to focus on sugar. And it turned out to be a good first choice. Sugar consumption has dramatically increased over the past 20 years. There's been a rapid rise in the amount of sugar that Americans consume. There's also been quite a few clinical accounts of sugar addiction. And by clinical accounts, I mean books that people write and publish and 
a lot of people read. And so here's a couple examples of just books that you could pick up in Barnes and Nobles or any bookstore where people talk about their history and their problems with sugar and how they are addicted to sugar. And so these are clinical accounts of this, and um, it's nice to see that we're now getting some additional clinical data to support some of these individual claims. So in order to establish this animal model of sugar binging, so we identify that we want to focus on sugar to start with, uh, we also want to focus on binging for a few reasons. And so in terms of um, defining what binge eating is, the dsm 4 criteria for an eating disorder state that um, you have to eat more than a normal amount in a short period of time, which is somewhat vague. Um, in order for something to be considered binging in terms of substance dependence, it has more to do with the escalation of intake over a period of time and taking a lot of a particular substance of abuse after a period of abstinence. So when we think of binging, we can think of it from an eating disorder standpoint and also from a, a drug abuse standpoint. Um, why binging? That's the question. Um, binging is something that is seen in a variety of different populations, and so it's been noted in people who are obese. It's also been noted in the general population of non-clinical patients or people who don't have a diagnosed eating disorder. And so it's not something that has been specific to bulimia nervosa or uh, people with binge eating disorder, the, the actual construct of binging is found among a variety of different uh, clinical groups. One thing to note is that there is a difference between binging and just overeating, and this is sometimes a fine line to walk because while I'm sure pretty much most of us in the audience have had a case in which we've ate more than we wanted to, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have a defined binge eating disorder. And so that's an important and clear distinction to make is that um, there is a line and there is a difference between clinical binge eating and binge eating, excuse me, and just simple overeating, which people sometimes tend to do. Okay, so um, our animal model is, is very simple, and here I have an example of one of our subjects. So we use frog dolly rats, which are your standard run-of-the-mill lab rat. Um, what we do is to induce the binging behavior, we fast them for 12 hours, and then we give them 12 hours of access to a sucrose solution, which is a 10% concentration, plus their regular rat chow, so they have a, um, a complete diet. And we do this about four hours into their dark phase. And now rats are nocturnal, so they, they tend to, uh, well, they do sleep during the light and they're awake during the dark. And so by giving them their first meal about one hour, in, or excuse me, four hours into the dark phase, it's basically sort of like they skipped breakfast. So it's something to stimulate them to perhaps overconsume the sugar. And we do this for about a month. And so one of the ways we measure um, their intake is through operant conditioning, and this allows us to um, have the animals lever press for the sucrose and then gives us a way to measure their meal structure. And so this graph shows on the top you can see that there's, um, these are the meal patterns of two example rats, one that was binging each day, this is the 12 hour rat, that's shown in blue, and another rat that had 24 hour ad libitum access to the sucrose. And what you see on the top graph, this is day one, you can see that all their, both of the rats basically have meals of the sugar throughout the day. They're drinking it and learning to consume it. If you look at the bottom panel, what's important to note is that the binging rat by day 21 is taking an excessively large meal of sucrose when it becomes available each day. And not only is this first meal large, but the other meals throughout the day are also quite large. So it seems that after having this um, 20, excuse me, 12 hour binge episode employed to them for about a month, they end up consuming larger, fewer meals throughout their access period. So in order to look at the neurotransmitters that I spoke about earlier, um, we use a technique called in vivo microdialysis, and this is a really great technique in which we can take animals that have, um, are freely moving around and they're consuming their sugar and doing whatever they would normally be doing, we can insert a probe in their brains and we can collect extracellular fluid and then assay it to see how much dopamine is being released or how much acetylcholine is being released. And so what we did in this case was we had our rats binging on sucrose and we also had some important control groups such as animals that are binging on chow just to isolate the variable of binge eating. Also animals that have it ad libitum so they have sugar and chow all the time so that isolates the variable of binging. And we also have a group that has sucrose just twice. So these animals get access to sucrose but only two times out of the month. So they have exposure to the sucrose sucrose, but they're by no means, you know, given it on a daily basis that would promote an addiction. And so this is the intake behavior, and I wanted to show this because this speaks to the tolerance and binging that we've been talking about. And so if you look on the left panel, this shows the total daily intake of sucrose for rats that are either binging, 
which is this uh, solid line, or rats that have ad libitum access. And what is important to note here is that there's an escalation in daily intake, and so this could be suggestive of tolerance in that both groups are actually increasing the amount of sucrose that they're consuming over the course of the experiment. What's also interesting to note is that the rats with the binge access, which is the black line, are consuming as much, if not more, sucrose than the rats that have it 24 hours a day, that they're doing it in half the amount of time. When we look at their one hour intake, we see that the rats that have binge access, which is the black bar, you can see that by day 21 of access, they are um, consuming greater size meals than the control groups that have sucrose twice or um, ad libitum sucrose. And on the bottom here, this is the chow intake of the rats that have binge chow. And we see that there's really no difference in the amount of chow that is consumed during that first hour. So this suggests that there's really no evidence of binging on chow. It seems that the binging is occurring only in the group that has access to sucrose and chow. So this is the dopamine data. And so the um, bar here represents the period during which the animal has access to sucrose. And what we see is that on day one, basically all the rats are releasing dopamine in response to sucrose. And this is what we would expect to see because as I said earlier, with response to um, a food, dopamine is released, but it seems to be more associated with novelty. This is the first time these rats are drinking sucrose, so we would expect that it would release dopamine in all the groups. The big point on this figure is that if you look on day 21 of access, it's only the group that has access to the sucrose and is binging on it every day that is still having a significant rise in dopamine release in response to it. The rats that have ad libitum access to sucrose show an attenuated dopamine release. The rats that have their second exposure to sucrose do not show a significant rise in dopamine release. And the rats here that have binge access to chow show a slight rise, but it's a non-significant rise in dopamine release. So clearly, the rats that are binging on the sucrose and chow are showing an enhanced release of dopamine relative to the other groups. In terms of acetylcholine, we see that acetylcholine, as I mentioned earlier, with response to food, seems to be associated with satiety. And so we find that rats that have an increase in acetylcholine um, on day 21 of access, it seems to peak later for the rats that are binging. And so this might be associated with a delay in the satiety effect that we see with response to acetylcholine. So the animals that have sucrose twice and ad libitum access to sucrose have their peak in acetylcholine release much earlier. And so we speculate that perhaps that this delay in acetylcholine rise might be perpetuating some of the binging behavior that we're observing. Okay, so next I want to talk about withdrawal. Um, and unfortunately, because of the time, I, I can't get into all all the data that we have, and I'd love to be able to talk about um, more of it, so I'm going to have to just sort of give an overview of it. Um, so when we talk about withdrawal, we're talking about opiate withdrawal because we're um, looking at this in response to uh, the opioid system. And so there are other drugs of abuse that can produce different types of withdrawal. We're focusing on opiate withdrawal for our studies. And so there's a clearly <coughs> defined syndrome for opiate withdrawal. And this is characterized by shakes and tremors, anxiety, and depression. And so these are the things that we normally see in humans, and we can also see them in rats as well. And so in order to look for behavioral signs of withdrawal in our rats, we give them a opiate antagonist called naloxone, and this precipitates withdrawal. And so we do this by putting them in something called the elevated plus maze. And so this is a, a tool in which you can measure anxiety in the rats. Um, if the rats are um, going into closed arms over here, they tend to be more anxious. If they will venture out into the open arms, it suggests that they're you know, just sort of doing exploratory behavior. Um, what we find is that rats will show behavioral signs of withdrawal when they're put in this elevated plus maze if they've been binging on sucrose and given naloxone. And so this suggests that the rats are in a state of opiate-like withdrawal. They're showing the sign of anxiety on the plus maze. Um, when we look at their brains and we look at acetylcholine and dopamine levels, we see here that dopamine, as is seen with most drugs of abuse, if we put them in the state of withdrawal with naloxone, there's a decrease in dopamine and an increase in acetylcholine, which has been like what's shown with other drugs of abuse. Also, we wanted to see what happens if we do this more in like a real life situation and we don't normally go around injecting ourselves with naloxone, we go on diets and stop eating the food. And so that's what we did with our rats. We didn't give them the sugar for 24 to 36 hours and we saw the same findings. We saw that the rats that had been binging will spend less time on that open arm of the plus maze which suggests that they're in a state of anxiety and withdrawal. And when we looked at their brains, we saw the same thing. There's a decrease in dopamine coupled with an increase in acetylcholine in the nucleus accumbens. So this suggests that even in spontaneous withdrawal, the animals are showing these signs of withdrawal. Okay, um, 
looking at craving and cross sensitization, which are other parts of this addiction spiral and the criteria that I discussed earlier, there's a different ways you can look at craving and cross sensitization. So I'm going to go over a few of the ones that we've done. We've used something called the deprivation effect. And this is where we have the animals on their respective binge eating diet then we abstain them for two weeks, and so they just have regular chow available, much like perhaps someone who is on a diet might do. When we reintroduce the sugar and give it back to them, what we find is that there's an a increase in the amount of sucrose that they consume. So they're consuming 25% more sucrose than they ever consumed before after this abstinence period. When we look at uh, locomotor activity, this is our way of measuring cross sensitization. We find that animals that are maintained on this binging diet, which are the animals in the black here, if we then take them off the diet and let them just have their uh, regular rodent chow for uh, a week, what we find is that if we give them then a low dose of amphetamine to test to see if there's a cross sensitization between sucrose binging and amphetamine, that these animals will have a very high response to this low dose of amphetamine after this abstinence period. And so this is a really dramatic finding because this suggests that these animals have primed their dopamine systems to now be receptive to other dopamine agonists, okay? So what we see is that the animals that were binging are now super sensitive to this uh, low dose of amphetamine, a dose that really does nothing to the other groups. So it's only the rats that are binging that seem to have this um, dopaminergic sensitivity. So also we were interested in consumatory cross sensitization. So if these animals are binging on sucrose and then they're given access to another drug of abuse. In this case we tried alcohol. What happens? So what we found was that rats that are binging on sucrose will have a higher consumption of alcohol when it's offered to them. And this is compared to other control groups that were either binging on chow, had ad libitum access to sucrose and chow, or ad libitum chow. So here we show that there's both locomotor and consumatory cross sensitization to known drugs of abuse when the animals have a history of binging on sucrose and chow. Again, I want to uh, revisit the problem, obesity. The only problem is that our rats don't get overweight. They're not obese. And so it turns out that rats that are binging on sugar are very good at controlling their calories. And this is something that uh, we should all take a page from. Um, so they actually will decrease the amount of chow consumed to um, compensate for the excess calories obtained from the sucrose. And so this results in normal body weight across groups. So despite these abnormal behaviors, they're still showing these, uh, they're still maintaining a normal body weight. So, while this doesn't help us solve the obesity epidemic, it does lead us to some further questions. And I don't have time to go over all the data that I have today, but I would love to talk about anyone who's interested. Two things I'll just mention. One, we're doing a whole series of studies, and we have a paper um, right now that's being reviewed looking at the effect of high fructose corn syrup, which is another type of sugar that we've heard about that is uh, mu much more popular than sucrose. And so, as you know, it has been on the rise, and people are consuming a lot more of it. What makes high fructose corn syrup very different than sucrose? A few things. It releases triglycerides. Triglycerides are what is released in response to a fat. It also releases insulin differently than sucrose or glucose does, okay? So it has different metabolic effects than sucrose. And it's also found in many or most of the foods that we consume. Okay, so I'm gonna have to just uh, run through these because I'm running out of time, but I'll go to uh, the data. So here's one of our example rats of a rat who's been binging or given access to high fructose corn syrup. And you can see that compared to his uh, little friend back there, he's quite large and overweight. And so we find that our animals on high fructose corn syrup have an increase in body weight, they have an increase in fat prat accrual, and they have an elevated circulating triglyceride levels. And so whether or not there's addiction-like properties associated with this sugar that's resulting in uh, increased body weights has just to be seen. We're, we're still working on that, but that's certainly on our plan. Um, finally, the other thing I want to note is we also have some experiments that we've done that I, I didn't include today looking at fat binging because we're interested in the different macronutrients and how they might affect addictive behaviors. And so um, while I can't get into it today, I will just say that um, Sugar and fats are very different in the way that we, they're consumed and the way that they seem to manifest the behaviors that could be associated with addiction. So I think that's an important next step for research to go in to identify exactly what foods are producing food addiction and in what ways those addictions are being manifested because I don't think it's going to be the same for all of them based on the properties of the macronutrients. Okay, so I just want to end by saying um, thank you to my colleagues, um, Bart Hobel, Peter Rada, and Sarah Leibowitz. Um, and also, these are some of the wonderful undergraduate students that have been assistants uh, with the research that I just presented. And um, I will leave my email. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you.
I'm convinced the sugar eating rats are addicted. Oh, good. <laughs> have you, have you ever um, cut open the uh, sugar eating rats to check fat pad mass? Yes, we have that as part of our high fructose corn syrup study. That was one of the control groups. And so those animals do not have increased fat pad accrual. Um, it's interesting because sucrose can increase body weight, but at the higher concentrations, it seems. And so we're using a 10% sucrose concentration. Right. And we use 30. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say most of the studies that have sh shown an increase in body weight is 30, 32% sucrose. So we're at a lower level there. Um, oh, I want to sort of piece out the glucose versus fructose question okay. with you here. Um, a lot of Bart's original data was with glucose yes. rather than with sucrose. I talked with him about this last year and mm -hmm. he said, well, you know, sucrose works that much better. And that's probably true. Um, but is it the, have you ever done a study with straight fructose only, number one? Mm -hmm. Number two, you just mentioned the study of high fructose corn syrup. What, was that controlled versus sucrose? And was it pear fed versus sucrose? Good questions. Um, in terms of the difference, some of the earlier studies that Bart published before I actually joined the lab um, were with glucose, and then he kind of switched over to studying sucrose. Um, most of the work that we've done as of late has been looking at sucrose. We haven't done a direct comparison of glucose versus sucrose. The reasoning behind sticking with sucrose, at least in my mind, has been that I'm trying to mimic sort of the, what people are consuming, and it seemed that people were consuming sucrose in excess of glucose. So that was one of the reasons to stick with that sugar. Um, your second question about fructose, we haven't assessed pure fructose. And so this is one of the problems that we've had with our literature reviews on uh, preparing for this high fructose corn syrup study is that there are quite a few studies that have been done with fructose, but there aren't many studies that have been done with high fructose corn syrup. And so there's differences between those two things. And that's something that um, you know, we're interested in, in knowing more about. The Amer American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in the end of 2008, mm -hmm. it was Ballyhooed in USA Today and everything else, had about five or six papers, one after another, mm -hmm. looking at the metabolic effects of high fructose corn syrup against sucrose and found absolutely no difference. Right. I, I actually believe that that's true. I right. don't think it, I mean, I think they're both equally bad. Right. Uh, you know, I don't think it, uh, I don't think that one is worse than the other. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to sort of piece together why your rats are responding differently. Is it that they really are consuming more? And like I said, if you, if you pair fed them like Jurgens right. did in mm -hmm. their study, mm -hmm. would it be that the weight gain would be the same, but the adiposity would be different? Right. We haven't pair fed the animals. That's certainly an important next step to take. But I do think that there are differences in high fructose corn syrup perhaps not so much in their composition, but in the way that they're metabolized and utilized within the body. And so there are papers showing that fructose releases insulin differently. For instance, it doesn't release pancreatic insulin in the way that sucrose does. And so that's one important difference. The fact that fructose can release triglycerides and sucrose doesn't is another important difference. So while I agree that this, the sugars in terms of their composition are very similar, they seem to have different effects. And so perhaps this is something that's done down the line in terms of the way that they're broken down in the body. But I agree, it's, it's controversial in the literature. There are several papers suggesting that fructose is not a bad thing, it's just like sugar, or excuse me, it's just like sucrose. And there are other people, like George Bray, for instance, who's saying that no, fructose is the worst thing you could ever eat. So I think that um, you know, it's something that really needs a lot more research, and that's why we're excited to be you know, doing those studies.